In baseball's first divisional series, the Los Angeles Dodgers are on the verge of an unprecedented playoff comeback. Jerry Royce needs one more out to beat the Houston Astros. And what looks like a foul ball turns out to be a third strike. The Dodgers have fought back from two games down to win the National League West. In Montreal for the league championship series, Fernando Valenzuela carries the hopes for another Dodger comeback. After trailing two games to one, the Dodgers even the series in square game five at 1-1. The Expos are still hopeful of their first pennant when Rick Monday faces a ninth inning showdown. An exultant climax to the Dodgers' remarkable uphill struggle. And when the Expos go down in the bottom of the ninth, the indomitable Dodgers celebrate their third National League pennant in five years. In the American League, the New York Yankees appear in danger of losing their division crown when the King of October, Reggie Jackson, stands in. The upstart Milwaukee Brewers lead the decisive fifth game two to nothing. Reggie's titanic homer explodes the quiet of the autumn evening and keys a spirited uprising. In the pinstripe tradition, the Yankees follow Jackson's cue and take a two-run lead, but there's one challenge left. Bruce Gossage walks the tying runs in the eighth and Don Money's at bat. The Brewers' last gasp falls just short, and the Yankees escape with their fifth division title in six years. The next hurdle is the Oakland A's. Goose Gossage leads the seemingly invincible Yankees to a convincing three-game sweep, and the stage is set for a New York-Los Angeles World Series. like the majestic New York skyline, the Yankees emerge with their 33rd pennant and bring the World Series back to this historic baseball shrine. For Los Angeles, it's those comeback Dodgers featuring familiar veterans along with outstanding rookies. the 11th time the Dodgers and Yankees have squared off and the second time that skippers Bob Lemon and Tom Lasorda have entered the picture. With 50 pennants between them, the Dodgers and Yankees have become a baseball tradition fraught with rivalry and revelry. And expectations are high for the 78th World Series as all eyes watch the Army's Golden Knights parachute team. More than 56,000 fans cheer as one, hoping to see the Yankees add to a streak of four straight home victories over the Dodgers, dating back to the 1977 and 78 series. Hard-throwing left-hander Jerry Royce, whose shutout wrapped up the Dodgers' first postseason comeback against Houston, faces switch-hitting center fielder Jerry Mumphrey in the bottom of the first inning. Yankees leading hitter is on with the first base hit of the series. It sounds like boo but it's really the sweet chant of Lou. Lou Pinella subbing for Reggie Jackson who's out with an injured leg. But Pinella is the Yankees second best October hitter and a proven professional who knows how to play the chalk. Mumphrey has to stop at third on the ground rule double, which is Pinella's 17th World Series hit. 
Now the Yankees are sitting pretty with righty Bob Watson facing a lefty. First base is open and a lefty is on deck. But the plan is to pitch to the bull. After 17 professional seasons and more than 1,700 big league hits, becomes the 17th player to homer in his first World Series at bat. This early uprising puts the lead into the hands of Ron Guidry, whose two previous series outings were both complete game wins against L.A. And now Rapid Ron is once again blowing him on by the men in Dodger blue. Louisiana Lightning strikes out four in a row and L.A. comeback hopes are grounded through seven innings. The Yankees lead five to one. But in the eighth those resourceful Dodgers score two more and now with a runner on first and one out Goose Gossage takes a gander at the Dodgers number one run producer Steve Garvey. That magnificent man in his pinstripe machine gives fans and players alike an unmistakable feeling of deja vu. This phenomenal play is strikingly similar to Nettle's acrobatics in the 78 series when he and his glove seem possessed of mystical power. While Yankee fans celebrate, Lasorda is left to dream of what might have been. In reality though the Dodgers still trail by two and the rest is just a formality. It's 1981's fifth straight postseason win for the Yankees and also their fifth straight World Series triumph over the Dodgers. Give the win to Guidry with assists from Gossage and Nettles as the home team wins game one for the seventh straight year. With their backs to the wall seems to be how the Dodgers play best. But if L.A. is the comeback team of the year, then Jimmy Cagney must be the comeback man of the year. At age 82, Cagney is back in the movies and back in his native city to throw out the first ball. Game two features pitchers Tommy John and Bird Hooten in a strict law and order story as enemy batsmen can muster only three hits through the first half of the game. But in the bottom of the fifth, Dodger trouble lurks around the corner. Two outs, give it hell, two outs. Larry Milburn at bat. Randolph scores the game's first run, and now the Dodgers have to search once more for that comeback spark. The Yankees, meanwhile, are looking for a sweep at home, and defending their turf is, of all things, an ex-Dodger, Tommy John, who, since trading Dodger blue for Yankee pinstripes three years earlier, is the American League's winningest pitcher. T.J.'s sinker ball had the Dodgers baffled, and the Yankee infield performed consistently as they had all year long. Across the diamond, the infield reads Bob Watson at first, Willie Randolph at second, Larry Milburn subbing at short, and Greg Nettles at third, rounding out the virtuoso quartet. and his larcenous mates are an integral part of a unique Yankee formula which so often spells relief. But the main ingredient is Rich Gossage, whose fastball is the great intimidator. 
In 1981, Gossage averaged more than a strikeout per inning with an earned run average of .77, and his postseason performance was scoreless. In his first two Dodger dates, the overpowering Gossage records two saves and four shutout innings, while fanning five forlorn figures in blue. Two games up, the Yankees are halfway to their 23rd World Series crown. But now it's off to the land where fairy tales can come true. A tale of two cities, a continent apart in more ways than one. Everywhere, the series commanders are stalked by the long shadows of baseball lore. It's the eighth time the boys of summer have enjoyed an autumn spectacular in Los Angeles. And hopes are high as both teams get ready for game three. time record Dodger Stadium crowd of more than 56,000 has turned out for game three. Certainly no surprise with 20 year old rookie phenom Fernando Valenzuela on the mound for his 15th home start and 14th sellout. The pride of Mexico became the toast of all baseball in 1981 winning his first eight starts and leading the majors in strikeouts and shutouts. The Yankees start the American League's top rookie Dave Brighetti. It's only the third World Series game ever pairing rookie starters. But there are cracks in the Yankee armor. Greg Nettles is sidelined with a thumb injury sustained in game two. Now the Yankees number one offensive and defensive stars of October's past Nettles and Jackson are reduced to the role of mere spectators. As game three gets underway, Ron Say and company are still looking for their first lead. Hello, Penguin. Nice and easy. Come on now, Say. Two men on for the Dodgers with two out in the bottom of the first. This three run home run by Ron Say makes it three to nothing. And coming against Rigetti, who had given up just one homer all season, it provides a clarion call to the home fans that the Dodgers are indeed back in it. But as night falls over Dodger Stadium, it's the Yankees who trumpet the sounds of an uprising. Dodger pitcher Fernando Valenzuela is struggling to locate his masterful Cy Young award-winning form. Bob Watson, the Yankees' hottest hitter, punches a hole in the legend of El Toro. It's the first homer of Fernando in 14 starts, and the Yankees go after the weakening rookie. Fernando's frustration tells it all. The Yankees can play this comeback game, too. And on the strength of Rick Cerrone's two-run homer in the fourth, the Bronx men have erased the Dodgers' early three-run advantage and now lead by one. George Frazier takes over for Rigetti while Aurelio Rodriguez fills in for Nettles at third. And in the fifth, Steve Garvey, a career 333 World Series hitter, tests the replacement.
It's the fifth hit of the series for Garvey. And after a Frazier walk, the chess game begins. Hey, hey! Lasorda resurfaces to offer a few words of advice for Pete's sake. Hear that. Watson coming charging on you. Don't let him charge you. Knock the ball by the first baseman. Come on. Every managerial command in a one-run game like this is magnified, and every at-bat is scrutinized. Guerrero's L.A. chop to third base and a double play ground out by Mike Sosia produce a pair of critical Dodger runs and swing the one run edge back to the home team. But in the top of the sixth inning, Lasorda is forced to question his faith in his charm prodigy. He's struggling, isn't he? He's all right, though. Huh? He's all right. Come to center. Cansado? Huh? Está bien. What's the good one? Got it down anyway. All right, come on. Vamos. Double the play. Come on. Come on. Come on. Go. Abandoned by the tools of his craft, Valenzuela is surviving. But it's survival on heart and hope. When the Yankees get two runners on in the eighth, it's a further test of Lasorda's trust. Despite having given up nine hits and a career-high seven walks, Valenzuela is left in to face Bobby Mercer, the American League's most productive pinch hitter. It's a bang-bang double play. Ron Say proves that Greg Nettles hasn't quite cornered the market on hot corner heroics. Say's brilliant play squelches a Yankee rally and caps a perfect day for number 10, both in the field and at bat. And now the final chapter is about to be written in the unlikely saga of the unflappable rookie and his emotional manager. This 5 to 4 win is a testament to the power of positive thinking, the emotion of Dodger fans, and the courage of a remarkable rookie. The Dodgers' comeback mission no longer seems impossible. Another record crowd shows up for game 4 and is treated to more thrills, spills and chills than even the night before. The debut of Reggie Jackson sets the torrid pace. Watson's sixth inning line drive is the game's 18th hit, and it produces the ninth run of the slugfest. But Dusty Baker interrupts the relentless drama to argue the trap ball ruling made by Nick Colosi, and the Dodgers' tempestuous manager joins the uprising. Nick, he caught the ball. I swear to God, he caught the ball, Nick. You weren't even out there to see it. He knows whether he I caught know, the I ball. Know what he caught it. All right, right then, he thinks he did. Okay, but haven't you ever missed one? Well, then you missed that one. Are you going to see it on the... Are you going to see it? How can you see that? You're going to see it later on? I'll tell you what, you're going to see it on the TV and you'll see it. Huh? That ball did not hit the ground. He said he caught it. He ought to know. Probably even Dusty doesn't know for sure, but one thing's certain. It'll go in the books as an RBI single for Bob Watson, and Lasorda will go away unhappy. The Dodgers now trail 6-3 in the sixth, a perfect spot for pinch hitter extraordinaire, Jay Johnstone. Ron Davis has put himself in a hole with a walk, but now gets ahead on the count. One ball, two strikes. Ironically, Johnstone was a member of the 78 Yankees. So he's the only Dodger to play on a World Series winner. The Dodger spirit has caught on everywhere. 
Davis now has but a fragile one run lead. And with Davy Lopes up, the glare of the October sun claims its number one son, Reggie Jackson. Lopes ends up at second, and the sounds of a Dodger rally are loud and clear. After Lopes steals one of his 10 straight postseason bases, Bill Russell greets an 0 2 pitch. Los Angeles gets its sixth run. The Dodgers, who seemed out of it at 4 0 and then 6 3, have fought back to tie. Lasorda is the maestro of this encore rally, and Dodger Stadium fans take his cue with their shower of affection. It's still a tie game in the eighth when championship series hero Rick Monday stands in with a man on first. With Jerry Mumphrey on the bench, Bobby Brown's center field efforts fall just short. An intentional walk loads the bases, and manager Bob Lemon dispatches a call to the bullpen. George Frazier had again pitched well, but just couldn't get the break. Stay with him. Can I just ask him why I pitched well on Baker? Yeah. Tony Coleman, three-eighths of an inch outside. He ain't that good. The call goes out to the bullpen, but for whom? The answer is Tommy John, pitching between starts, who becomes the game's 10th pitcher. I saw so many chicken hits in my life. They can bounce a lot of ways like a football. Game eight, ball the ball hit you. Steve Yeager, the first batter he faces, gives the Dodgers the go-ahead run with a sacrifice fly, the home team's first lead of the game. Now Davey Lopes is looking to provide a little insurance. And so he does. The Dodgers' eighth run equals their total for the first three games combined. And Los Angeles has incredibly taken a two-run lead. As the game enters its fourth hour, Steve Howe tries to maintain this new balance of power, but Reggie Jackson, who's been a focal point of this epic's best and worst moments, has other ideas. The October Marble becomes only the sixth player to reach base five times in one series game. And now it's a one-run contest with an inning to go. Ninth inning, the tying and winning runs on. Two outs and up steps the Yankees' postseason power, Willie Randolph. Yankee hopes hang on Randolph's drive, but it's not deep enough. The Dodgers feel the sheer joy of having survived. And the World Series is tied at two games apiece. The World Series always presents a challenge for players of both teams. Each player's role is to be ready. Each participant has his own ritual, a time-worn regimen. He's a lonely performer, oblivious to the masses, lost in a sea of concentration. It's a grueling, sometimes frightening waiting game. But when thrust upon center stage, he must be prepared for anything. Game five, and after the frantic pace of game four, Jerry Royce hopes to set a more peaceable tone. This familiar number 44 has an 11-game World Series hitting streak, which includes 20 base hits and a 500 average.
for the sixth straight time, Jackson's aboard, further upping his World Series record slugging percentage. After an error by Davy Lopes puts runners at the corners, another fastball hitter, Lou Pinella, takes a bite of Mr. Royce's meat and potatoes. For the fourth time in five games, the Yankees break on top. But the visitors will go on to strand six runners in the next three innings, again failing to deliver the big hit. Dave Winfield, hitless in 16 at-bats, is a chief culprit. But Winfield proves that good things come to those who hit line drive. The game's highest salaried star breaks the tension by asking for the ball like a wide-eyed souvenir hunter. It's a rare touch of levity in a tense one-run game. With a stymied attack, the Yankees have to resort to their stingy ways of games one and two. And here, Winfield is a key contributor. In the seventh, it's still a one-run ball game. Guidry has retired 15 of the last 16 Dodger batters. And although he averages only six innings per outing, he shows no signs of wilting. Pedro Guerrero at bat. Suddenly, it's a tie ball game. Just when it appears the spell's worn off, the Dodgers find their comeback magic again. Still, Lemon sticks to his laissez-faire doctrine, letting Guidry face another dangerous righty, Steve Yeager. The serenity of a Sunday afternoon pitching duel has been shattered by back-to-back -back home runs. And with shocking speed, the Dodgers have taken a two-to-one lead. These are the October Dodgers, a club with unquenchable desire and unbounded confidence. An inning later, Jerry Royce is one out away from finishing the task. The Dodgers have done the unthinkable. Three straight, heart-stopping, come-from-behind victories. And what seemed like a pipe dream two weeks, even two days ago, is now one win from reality. Only an incident from the game's eighth inning mars the Dodgers' festive mood. Ron Say dug in against Goose Gossage with the count 0-1. It was a 94-mile-an-hour fastball that landed on Say's helmet, and the Dodgers' most valuable infielder in the series can only be thankful for the headgear. Already sidelined once this year by a pitched ball, the hometown hero is dazed but not seriously injured. And it's hoped he'll be back in the lineup when the series resumes in New York for game six. Since departing these friendly skies a week ago, the Yankees have been singing nothing but the blues. A more cheery tune is what Ron Say has in mind, for a rainout has given him an extra day to recover. Both starting third basemen will be back in the lineup, with Greg Nettles making his first appearance since game two. So the rain seems a boon to both clubs. The Dodgers start game six with their hard luck loser of game two, Bird Hooten, the last Dodger to win in the Bronx back in 77. Bottom of the third, nothing, nothing, and the batter is Willie Randolph. The Yankees, who've never lost a six-game World Series, take the lead. But in no time at all, the Dodgers are threatening. In the top of the fourth, with two on and two out, Tommy John is trying to extend his series scoreless inning streak to 13. 
But catcher Steve Yeager, who had only 86 at bats all season, prepares once again for a Yankee Southpaw. Baker's run will be the only one allowed by John thanks to the series most controversial strategy in the bottom of the fourth Greg Nettles doubles and with two outs Larry Milborn has walked intentionally to get to John Bob Lemon then decides the future is now Bobby Mercer is called on to pinch hit with the DH rule not in effect this series Yankee pitchers have gone 0 for 14. Mercer comes within a warning track of making Lemon's move look good, but it's out number three. And with TJ's arm put away for the winter, this 1-1 game becomes a second guesser's delight. In relief is George Frazier, the first pitcher in 40 years to lose two straight series games. A subpar Ron Say finds himself in a key spot, lopes on second with two out. This RBI single opens the floodgates as the artful Dodgers continue to produce runs in every way imaginable. There's no looking back for Yankee fans. They now have to get Pete Guerrero or else. Or else watch their World Series hopes slip away. Two more Dodger runs come scampering home on a 430 foot triple by the red hot Guerrero, and the Dodgers widen the gap. In the top of the sixth, the Dodgers had four more runs off a Yankee bullpen once thought to be invincible. Dodgers are pouring it on. Nothing will stop them now. Not even another gem by Greg Nettles. Four relievers yield eight Dodger runs, and now Steve Howe looks ready to end the Yankees' misery. How fitting that Reggie Jackson should have the last chance, but Davy Lopes' sixth series error delays the celebration. For the fifth time in history, the Dodgers are World Series champions. It's only the second time a team has swept four straight after losing the first two. But after several frustrating near misses, this resilient team with its uncommon resolve was not to be denied. The secret to this Dodger uprising? Well, perhaps it's that rare blend of exuberance, class, and character. The Dodgers took turns sharing the October spotlight, and three World Series MVPs were chosen. Ron Say, who keyed the comeback, represents a Dodger infield that's been together nine seasons. Pedro Guerrero, in games five and six, produced a double, triple, two homers, and six RBIs. And Steve Yeager earned his share of the award with two game winners. The Dodgers' autumn uprising gave resounding proof of the team's unconquerable will to win. And so the unshakable faith of the Dodgers and their devoted followers brings Los Angeles the 1981 World Championship.